senang sekali sambil menunggu yang lain ya ini karena uh, kebetulan begini dokter Mark ini sedang berada di Indonesia untuk beberapa kegiatan yang pertama adalah um, uh, beliau memang berbicara di seminarnya atau konferensinya uh, Topeko Control yang dilakukan oleh Muhammadiyah uh, Topeko Control Center seminggu minggu yang lalu dan kemudian minggu ini uh, Pusat Perilaku dan Promosi Kesehatan kerjasama dengan FETP itu menyelenggarakan data to action yang kami mendapatkan dana dari CDC dan Pak Mark ini juga sebagai salah satu narasumbernya siang ini beliau akan ketemu dengan Wakil Dekan 2 bidang kerjasama nanti setengah 2 tapi sebelumnya beliau tadi juga memberikan kuliah tamu di Fakultas Kedokteran di UKDW jadi diantara itu ada kosong terus saya bilang mau enggak men juga memberikan kuliah untuk di S2 IKM gitu ya jadi ternyata mau dan memang waktunya ini adalah waktu yang window time nya ya jadi mohon maaf ini jam 12an yang belum makan nanti ditahan dulu yang sudah makan ya berarti sudah tenang ya yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I just explain that uh, you have a window time that you can come here and then you are thank you very much that you are uh, yeah willing to give and share your experience to this uh, graduate program of public health. So all of them are the student from the uh, graduate program of public health. Maybe some of them also from the graduate program that in uh, at faculty of medicine because I asked the secretary of graduate program to put this announcement to all the graduate program students. And, uh, and also I would like to thank too because you are don't mind, doesn't mind that uh, your lecture will be documented so we can put on the our webinar so for those who are cannot coming to this lecture they can see it or see you and listening to your lecture through the uh, webinar so this also I would like to thank too but uh, for all of this I would like to thank that you can come and then you can share and I apologize that I cannot uh, uh, hear to be here because I have to attend the defense yeah but sudah lama di Topeko Control Research Branch di National Cancer Institute ini banyak memberikan dana penelitian sebetulnya jadi nanti silahkan kalau mau tanya bagaimana dapat dananya dari NCI ya jadi ini jauh-jauh dari Amerika silahkan and the state is yours thank you um, so good afternoon everyone I'm uh, glad to be here as well um, I've been enjoying uh, my time here in uh, in Jogja and um, getting to know many uh, researchers and uh, public health professionals uh, here. So I'm, uh, as you heard, I'm uh, an epidemiologist in the tobacco control research branch at the National Cancer Institute. So um, uh, we are, are a research institution um, and really my work focuses on tobacco use, its effects, and uh, tobacco control. Um, which obviously is an important uh, theme in, in public health. Um, uh, so I wanted to um, give a little bit of background on sort of the evolution of tobacco control efforts. I know some of you may be, you know, had some introduction to this already, um, but I think that's helpful background. Also to talk, give some examples of how we have used research, uh, public health research, to overturn uh, some myths about uh, tobacco control and um, then uh, to talk about uh, some future research questions and opportunities. Um, so um, I think you all are probably already familiar with the health effects of tobacco use if you're studying medicine and public health. Um, you should be familiar, familiar with this but we know that uh, about half of all smokers will die of a tobacco related disease um, and that uh, smokers die an er average of 15 years earlier than, than non-smokers. Uh, we also know smoking is a leading a risk factor for um, a risk factor for six of the leading eight causes of death worldwide. Includes not only familiar 
things like cancer and heart disease, but also we know that there's a relationship between tobacco use and tuberculosis uh, and other conditions. So here's just a brief overview of the global burden of tobacco use. Um, so we estimate that tobacco use uh, accounts for about 20% of cancers worldwide. Um, it also uh, accounts for a substantial proportion of other cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, and then, as I mentioned, about 20% of TB uh, incidence. So we know that smokers are more likely to develop a tuberculosis infection, they're more likely to have a recurrence, and they also um, do not do as well on treatment compared with non-smokers. So this is obviously a major uh, public health uh, problem. I'd say it's you know, one of the leading causes of preventable death worldwide, and probably going to become even increasingly so, because what we're seeing is now on a, on a global scale that uh, non-communicable diseases like cancer and heart disease and diabetes are all becoming much more important. Um, and particularly in many uh, low and middle income countries where traditionally most deaths have been due to infectious diseases, um, we're starting to see that change now. So in the future, um, tobacco caused diseases and other uh, uh, chronic uh, and non-communicable diseases are going to become uh, increasingly important for public health practice. So I just wanted to step back uh, in time a little bit. So this is um, the cover of the 1964 Surgeon General's report. So this was a report released in the US. Um, it was the first uh, government report at the time to sort of make the link between smoking and cancer and other diseases. And one of the conclusions of that report was that um, cigarette smoking is a health hazard of sufficient importance to warrant appropriate remedial action. So what that means is that um, at that time, this was over 50 years ago, they thought that there was enough evidence to show that smoking is harmful, but also that there's enough evidence to justify taking some kind of action. They didn't say yet what that action should be, but that we need to do something to control tobacco use. This chart here just shows the um, pattern of tobacco consumption in the U.S. throughout the 20th century. So um, uh, the reason I show this is because um, the tobacco epidemic started much earlier in the, in the U.S., so I think we can learn something by looking at this history. Um, the, uh, um, and hopefully uh, in, um, here in Indonesia, you can uh, avoid, uh, uh, you know, intervene more quickly and avoid going through the same experience that we had in the U.S. But as you can see, there was a dramatic rise in smoking uh, for the first half of the century. Then at the peak is where the Surgeon General's report came out. And then there was a s slow decline over the years after that. So when this report came out, it got a lot of news coverage, you know, saying that, you know, we have the science now to say that smoking is a cause of lung cancer and other diseases. But smokers didn't immediately give up their cigarettes. Um, so even though they knew what the risks were. They continued to, to smoke. And it really took many years after that before we started to really see a decrease in smoking prevalence. And that was through um, a variety of activities. Uh, and, you know, it also included a lot of research to try and understand what are the um, effective ways to change uh, tobacco smoking behavior. This just shows the decrease as well as you can see in the, um, you know, 50 years ago, um, uh, smoking was very highly prevalent. You would see even at uh, medical conferences and things, the doctors would all be smoking. Uh, that's not the case now. So, uh, you know, there has been a real shift, I think, um, uh, um, there. So, I think we can, uh, we've learned a lot in those years, in the past few decades, about what works to change people's behavior. So aside from telling people that smoking is harmful, what else can we do to try and change their behavior, um, to prevent kids from starting to smoke, to help adult smokers to quit, to just sort of raise awareness among the population about um, the hazards of smoking, and to change the social norms around smoking? so that um, 
smoking does not become uh, just uh, you know uh, the norm is not acceptable, but is seen as something that um, uh, is frowned upon. So there was kind of a, a learning curve that, that occurred here. So for the first thing was we tried to intervene by telling people smoking is harmful, putting the warning label on cigarettes as smoking is harmful to your health. Uh, that was helpful, but it didn't really, that wasn't enough to really change people's behavior. The second uh, approach was to try and intervene more aggressively by um, uh, you know, working with smokers to, in the clinic to help them to, to quit smoking um, by doing educational programs in the schools and this sort of thing. Uh, but even that was not enough to make by itself to make a dramatic impact in smoking prevalence. So eventually uh, what developed is this idea of comprehensive tobacco control programs that we need to Yes, we need to have warnings about the health risks of smoking. We need to do education. But we also need to have other policies uh, in place to, if we want to change behavior on a, on a big scale. Um, so some of the things we might see in a uh, comprehensive tobacco control program include things like raising taxes, raising the price of tobacco products, which makes them less accessible to, to, to kids um, who might start buying tobacco products. Also banning smoking in public places, which kind of changes the social norms around smoking. People see it's not something acceptable to do in the workplace or in a restaurant. Um, also doing strong anti-tobacco marketing campaigns on a big scale. Uh, these are all the kinds of things that um, and we found that uh, cities and states and countries that have implemented um, a number of these measures have ha made substantial progress in, in tobacco control and reducing tobacco use. Um, so here's just one example of a recent campaign um, uh, that was uh, rolled out on a national scale in the US just over the last couple of years. It's, it's still uh, running now. Um, but the idea here was to, to find a way, how do you get the message across to people about the hazards of smoking in a way that will really get their attention? Um, so again, especially when you're dealing with young people, just telling them, oh, you shouldn't smoke uh, is not going to actually get them to change their behavior. You know? um, and so um, I think you know, through research, we have a much better idea now what kinds of messages are effective. Uh, so the goal of this campaign was to focus on the stories of individual people, uh, real people, not actors, you know, really telling their story about how they had been affected by smoking, uh, to show how, you know, cigarette smoking has immediate adverse effects, and also how people, not only do they die early from smoking, but many people are, um, live many years uh, with a smoking-related disease. So there are many years of, of suffering or, you know, um, living a lower quality of life because of their smoking. And that was another message, I think, that resonates with people. And then also to show them that there are um, resources to help people to quit. Um, and so the um, research that's been done has shown that this campaign has actually been very effective in motivating smokers to quit. Here's just one of the images from the campaign. And as you can see, uh, so this was a 45-year-old man who had a heart operation, um, and uh, he was a you know long-time smoker. Um, and there's all there are also videos that go along with this campaign, and he kind of tells the story about his smoking, um, how it's affected him, and how even after the operation, he continues to suffer from the effects of smoking. Um, and that just uh, you know makes the the impact much more immediate and and real to the viewers. Here's another area where um, we have learned a lot over the years through public health research. Um, so the early warning labels on cigarettes were generally text only, you know. Um, and, uh, but then a number of countries started to introduce these graphic warning labels, which were much more effective at getting the attention of, of the smokers. Um, and you can see they had pictures of, of diseased lungs and, and um, uh, gum disease and other things. So 
here's an example of some data that was done to evaluate what the impact of a gra introducing a new graphic warning label is. So um, this was an international study and you can, uh, comparing a few countries. And you can see um, uh, the green line is Australia there. And so in 2005, Australia introduced this new graphic warning label. And what this data represents is it shows the proportion of smokers who uh, tried to avoid looking at the warning label on their packages. So they would put a sticker over the warning label or they would put this package inside another container, um, anything they could to avoid looking at that picture. And you can see in the green line, when the new graphic warning label went into effect in Australia, there was a dramatic increase in the number of smokers who tried to sort of cover up that warning label, you know, use various strategies to not have to look at it. Um, you know, this doesn't necessarily mean they all actually uh, went on to quit smoking, but we do know from this that those warning labels got their attention, which was the, um, you know, obviously the primary aim there. So I just want to briefly go through um, three examples where um, uh, we have been able to overturn uh, misconceptions about smoking and health through evidence. And I think this is important because it's important to understand the role of research in doing public health. Um, so many times we have to um, communicate to the public uh, you know, the importance of intervening to, to, uh, through tobacco control, through implementing policies, and we need evidence to justify that. Um, and sometimes we have to overcome misconceptions, misunderstandings in the population. We have to overcome uh, claims by the tobacco industry and others who are fighting uh, increased regulation. So the research is an important uh, piece of, um, uh, you know, getting those messages across. So the first one is, um, first myth is this idea that light or mild cigarettes are less harmful than regular cigarettes. And I, I know there are, um, you see the mild cigarette brands are very popular here. Um, uh, and we've seen a similar pattern in many other countries. And, you know, the data suggests that many smokers who choose a mild cigarette brand do so because they think it's doing less damage to them. They think, well, they're, they're getting less tar from the cigarette, therefore they, their, their risk is less. Um, and this is really a, a, not a new strategy. It's been around a long time. So this is an ad from the 1970s where a cigarette was marketed as having only three milligrams of tar. And the implication is, therefore, it's going to be less harmful. Um, and this uh, diagram here shows the change um, in, uh, um, over time in the proportion of uh, cigarette sales that were made up by that mild, low tar category. So you can see over time as the tobacco industry increasingly marketed these brands as mild, low tar, um, they, their sales increased dramatically uh, because smokers began to switch uh, to those milder brands. But as we studied smokers over years to see what happened, um, and this was really took years of epidemiologic studies because, uh, <clears throat> you know, we had to follow uh, people who smoke a, a light or mild cigarette, compare them with people who smoke a full flavor cigarette, and then follow them up over time and see, um, you know, basically count the number of cancers and other tobacco related diseases in each group. And <clears throat> basically, what the epidemiologists found was that there really was no difference. Um, the people who smoked the mild cigarettes had the same risks of lung cancer or heart disease as people who smoked the regular cigarettes. Um, and we also did research to um, sort of understand the smoking behavior more in more detail. And what we found was that um, smokers, because they're addicted to nicotine, if they switch from a cigarette with a high level of tar and nicotine to a cigarette with a low level of tar and nicotine, they change the way they smoke the cigarette. So they tend to inhale the smoke more deeply. They take more puffs off of the cigarette. Um, and they do that because they're addicted and they um, want to get that same uh, nicotine hit that they're used to. They may not even be conscious that they're doing this, but, but they do that. So, the um, 
level of tar and nicotine that's measured in the test does not represent what the smoker actually takes in. Um, so, um, uh, so once we began to understand that, we began to understand that just because a cigarette is labeled as mild doesn't mean that you know, the smoker is actually getting any less of the tar and nicotine. Um, and this is actually a report um, that NCI put out a few years ago on this, sort of summarizing the evidence on this topic, um, trying to overturn that, that myth. So another myth we see a lot is um, some smokers will say that, um, well, I've already been smoking, so uh, it, you know there's no point in stopping now. The damage has already been done. H how can I reduce my risk if I've already started to smoke? Um, well, we do know actually that um, uh, there is uh, there are now um, you know many studies of people who have quit smoking years ago, and we have had the evidence to follow them up and see how their risk is, and we can see that. Um, people who quit smoking actually are able to reduce their risk, even if they've been smoking in some cases for 20 years or more. Um, so we know that when someone quits, there are some immediate uh, things that happen, some immediate improvements, particularly related to, to uh, the heart and cardiovascular system. Um, we also know that actually lung cancer risk uh, varies greatly um, among people who quit versus those who don't. So you can see the red line here shows people who continued to smoke and never quit, continued to smoke the rest of their life. Um, near the, you know, as they get older, their um, risk of lung cancer increases uh, dramatically. I mean, it just shoots up as they, as they get older. Those who stop at age 30, their risk uh, is actually not much higher than that of a non-smoker. It, it is higher, but not a lot higher. And those who stop at age 50, even after they've smoked for 30 years or so, they have a, a higher risk than the non-smoker, but it's still much less than the person who continues to smoke. So I think that's another important message is, um, you know, that even for people who have been smoking for a long time, they do get a great benefit in reducing their risk from, um, uh, from quitting. And in terms of thinking about public health interventions, this is important because we have to think, um, you know, oftentimes there is um, a lot of attention given to preventing smoking among kids, which is important, but we can also do a lot of good in public health terms in reducing morbidity and mortality by helping even long-time smokers to quit. And <clears throat> finally, um, I just wanted to give an example of where, you know, we've, um, you know, in studying, uh, to the public health impact of tobacco use and, ha and how to do tobacco control, we have to understand not just the nature of the risk and the you know, related diseases, but we need to find out um, what evidence do we need to support effective tobacco control policies. Um, and you know, sometimes we need to persuade policymakers who are not in the health sector, but are in other areas. And we need to have data to show um, that whatever tobacco control policy we're proposing is going to be beneficial. So one of the myths we often hear in this, um, you know, uh, there are always, uh, um, you know, um, when a city puts in place, say, a new smoke-free law that bans smoking in, in workplaces, including restaurants and hotels, um, there's often a lot of debate about it, and one of the concerns that's raised is, well, will this put small businesses, you know, restaurants out of business? Maybe people will stop going to restaurants if they're not allowed to smoke there anymore. Um, and this is also kind of a myth that's promoted by the tobacco industry as well. Um, and this is just an example from, uh, so New Orleans, a city in the U.S., um, which is uh, one of the things it's known for is it's a big tourist destination. A lot of people go there, particularly to go out and hear music. New Orleans is famous for jazz music. People go out at night to clubs and bars to hear music. And so a lot of people were concerned that when this law went into, a play, in, law went into place, it would put those uh, you know, music bars out of business and it would kind of ruin the, the culture of, of New Orleans. Um, but in fact, what we found is, and now 
you know, there have been studies done in cities around the world, e even entire countries that have imposed smoke-free laws, um, uh, such as Ireland um, and others. Uh, you know, they found that in general, these smoke-free laws do not hurt businesses. Um, so that is, if you look at the um, income of a restaurant uh, in an area that goes smoke-free both before and after the policy, generally there is not evidence that the restaurants, uh, you know, and other uh, venues lose money by the smoking ban. Um, so I think this is important because, um, you know, it, it, uh, we want to think about um, what evidence do we need to collect in order to uh, help uh, decision makers to implement the kinds of public health policies that are going to really make a difference. Um, so we need to have evidence not just about health, but also how to counter some of these claims uh, about the potential adverse effects of, of tobacco control policies. Um, so this is just the IARC report that reported some of this evidence. Um, so I think um, I'll, I'll briefly uh, describe it. So this is just an example of another study that was done in Mexico City. I think this is helpful as an example of a, um, a you know a well conducted public uh, well conducted study to evaluate a public health policy. So what they did is they wanted to uh, measure the effect of a smoke free policy that went into place in Mexico City. So they banned smoking in Mexico City in all workplaces, all restaurants, and and hotels. Um, and they wanted to see if it hurt the business of those restaurants. Um, and so the policy went into effect uh, where the red line is on the right. And you can see after that, it looks like there is actually a drop. Um, and so this chart shows um, uh, the, uh, basically the revenue, the income, hospitality venues, including restaurants, throughout that time. You can see after the law went into effect, it looks like there is a bit of a drop. But what they did here is they took measurements not only in Mexico City, but also in other cities around the country. So that way they had a, a con like a control group, a comparison group. So they could compare what's the impact of the policy in the city where it went into effect. And then what is the, imp you know, what, what, what is the pattern in other cities that did not have a policy change? And what they found was that they saw the same drop in revenue in the other cities that didn't implement the policy. So what that suggests is that it was not the policy that caused the drop in revenue, but it was uh, probably some, something else. And at, at this time, um, uh, Mexico was going through an economic recession. So it makes sense people were going out less to restaurants because of the recession. They had less money to spend, and it was not because of the smoking policy. So I just give that as an example of when we do these kinds of studies, it's really important to um, uh, you know, it's, uh, to be able to do a comparison, look not just at what happens in the city where the policy is implemented, but to be able to compare that uh, elsewhere as well. So, um, just in, um, so I wanted to move on, just to say a few words about uh, you, you know some uh, new challenges we see in tobacco control and uh, potential research opportunities going going forward. Um, so these are some of the issues that um, I think you, you all may face as you're thinking about research projects or, or a public health career in the future. So we know that um, tobacco smoking is in increasingly um, uh, moving to um, low and middle income countries while many high income countries have um, uh, over the last decades reduced smoking prevalence dramatically. We're seeing smoking prevalence continue to increase in uh, many low and middle income countries and um, including in, in Indonesia, which still has a very high smoking prevalence, especially among men. Um, and uh, this chart just shows how, um, uh, you know, countries may be at different places along this curve. So um, some, uh, I, I think Indonesia is probably somewhere in this stage two area in that, um, you know, we, we, we've seen high smoking prevalence among men. Uh, Smoking prevalence may be starting to increase among young women, um, uh, but it's still early on. But we probably haven't seen the full impact yet of 
um, in terms of disease, morbidity, and mortality. Uh, so in the future, um, if there isn't any change, we're likely to see an increasing number of smoking-related uh, you know, cancers, uh, heart disease, and, and, and deaths. And so that's going to become an increasingly important, important feature in, in the public health landscape. Mm -hmm.